Welcome back to Archaeology After Dark, everyone. I am, of course, your host, Daniel Rhodes. My guest today is Dr. Benjamin Seidel. Benjamin, thanks for being here. Hey, a pleasure, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. Always glad to have enthusiastic folks on this program. So, Benjamin, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am a uh, full professor in the Department of Anthropology at East Carolina uh, University. Uh, I've got my um, BA in basically classics and Near Eastern archaeology from Brandeis and then went on to do a master's in divinity school or theological studies at Harvard University and then uh, earned my PhD in anthropology there. And my research interest is in nomadic peoples, past and present. And that brings us to what we're talking about today. I know a lot of people have a different image of what they think nomadism is, especially here in the United States. You know, the more recent trope of nomadism is a guy in a leather jacket in the 70s just riding down a dusty road through Kansas. But historically, nomadism is a lot less um uh, motorcycle <laughs> right what um yeah i'm sorry go ahead daniel so what we're going to talk about is a i guess a more historic context of nomadism okay um well looking at it from two different perspectives at least for me when I look at nomadic peoples, I'm basically looking at uh, mobile families in the archaeological record, and not so much the Marlboro Man, as, as you alluded to. <laughs> Excuse me. So, and really, um, for those that are interested in, in nomads, Tom Barfield wrote a great uh, popular book on the nomadic alternative. And for him, it's all about the families. And I adopted that in my research. So we're looking at mobile families, and when we're looking at nomadic peoples, especially, I mean, you mentioned in the States, but even in the Middle East where I work, they're kind of, as a rule, below the radar screen of archaeological interest. Now, there are, um, there has been a, um, a small group of scholars in Israel that work on nomads, uh, mainly in proto-historical periods. And in prehistorical periods, like Steve Rosen, Tali Guinea, Modi Hyman, and I, and when I was a grad student, I worked with them. They helped train me and introduce me to the field. So I had the benefit of uh, working on nomadic societies in prehistory. But as you know, in anthropology, we like to do ethnographic analogies, and what was really tempting is to make an ethnographic analogy between. Um, Bedouin populations, like those popularly depicted in Lawrence of Arabia, that type of thing, um, to earlier periods. And what I realized is that we know very little or almost nothing archaeologically about the recent examples of nomads. So my research is basically focusing on those people, on those tribes, to get an understanding of, the, of them from an archaeological perspective, as well as a historical perspective, too. So how you do short, you, yeah. you, you go ahead. No, I people ask short questions and I tell them I give long answers. So interrupt <laughs> me if necessary. <laughs> so nomads, by definition, move around on a, you know, a month by month, year by year basis. How does an archaeologist go about following somebody on a path like that? Well, it's a good question. And I think the way that um, myself and others look at it is to, uh, first of all, find the sites. Essentially, you're doing prehistoric archaeology. The sites are very ephemeral. And depending where uh, the environment that you're working in, the landscape really obviously has a major impact on the archaeological signature of these populations. So, for example, um, there's a project at Mississippi State that's been working in the northern Negev, and I've worked with them on, on the nomadic element of the project. And essentially what we're talking about are sherd scatters of pottery that are indicative of campsites. The area is deep plowed, 
to about a meter. So you're not going to find, you may find ash, but most of the sites are, are pretty much blown out. If you go further south, the less people, the less agricultural potential of the land, you start to find, especially as the environment changes, the remains of tents pretty clearly. Not only of, you know, tents from say 1700 to 1948, but tents from the classical era. So these are tents we don't think of as like a canvas material. It's more of like a skin or hide material, I assume. Well, it depends. For the prehistoric and historical um, examples, we're probably talking maybe maybe using, um, for the prehistoric examples, what we tend to see are footings, like little stone walls in a circle, maybe about two feet high, at most three. The interpretation is brushwood would be placed on top of it. One of the things that uh, when we're talking about nomads, uh, we need to remember is the types of animals that they use relate to, as you mentioned earlier, about how far they move, right? So one of the things is that camels really aren't domesticated to the first millennium BC. So your prehistoric examples are using uh, donkeys, and they're incapable of going very deep into the desert with large loads. Once we get into camp domesticated camels, that's where we see the types of tents that you alluded to with canvas, with ropes, because camels can carry obviously much heavier loads and they can go deep into the desert because their water requirements are conducive to uh, penetrating the interior of those arid areas. So I imagine nomadic peoples in the desert, like you mentioned, would follow a water source instead of like a herd of moving animals like it would here in the what is now the United States or a more um, lush landscape. Well, they would. Um, it depends. It's it's um, one of the things when we're talking about nomads is in different periods, they're doing different things. So we tend to think of nomads as people that are always committed to engaging in animal husbandry, raising livestock. And the research that I'm doing in, um, in the Northern Negev, a number of people have noted that those nomads are basically starting to engage in agriculture, uh, at least in the uh, mid 19th century. And we know that, um, by the beginning of the 20th century, they're actually exporting grain to different parts of the Mediterranean basin. In fact, I'm not the first to suggest this by any means, but I'll just point it out that uh, the barley that they're growing is being uh, bought by grain merchants in what's today Gaza. And then it's being shipped. One of the destinations is Great Britain to brew beer, pale ales and IPAs. So you do have you do have them raising livestock, but in certain parts of the Middle East, when they see an opportunity to kind of benefit by changing their economy and moving away from animal husbandry into agriculture, uh, some of them will do that. So what you're saying is they maintain the nomadic lifestyle even until like recently. Yes. So when we're talking about uh, the nomads that I'm looking up, I'm looking, sorry, that I'm looking at, uh, people are still living in tents up until 19, up until the 1948 war. Uh, even after that, when you have a small minority of Bedouins still in Israel, they will, up until I'd say in the 90s, some of them are still living in tents. Uh, be, but that's pretty much uh, gone by the boards now. They're most of them are pretty urbanized or living in an urban context. But uh, prior to that development, um, yeah, you can see in aerial photographs taken by the British in uh, the mid in 1945, um, Bedouin tent camps. In fact, um, one of the challenges that the British had when they controlled Mandate Palestine was doing a census. And what they did was basically used aerial photographs and then counted the tents and then multiplied by, I think, five to get population estimates. And I use those photographs in my archaeological research. 
So you use the aerial photographs to help you locate potential sites for excavation, assuming you can get to them, that is. Yeah, um, as potential sites for excavation, or if the area has been heavily impacted, sherd scatters would be the the archaeological remains of of those tent camps. And in one area where I worked, we uh, surveyed uh, 100 square kilometers, a 10 by 10 unit, and found over 3,000 sherd scatters. And this area has no... There are no villages in this area, so it's not as if we're missing, you know, these representing villages. It's an area that um, up until the development of and the importation of diesel pumps for water um, had no villages because it was just not enough water to make agriculture, uh, irrigation agriculture, a going concern, so to speak. So with the development of things like diesel technology and things like that, would nomadic people like the ones you're studying become more uh, stationary? Yes, in many parts. When they, can, when they can become more stationary, settle down, yes, definitely. So with the, like I said, the development of technology, would their lifestyles change in any way just because they're more stationary? Um, yeah, the ones that, in part, um, these people that I'm studying, they don't make pottery. So, for example, they are acquiring a type of courseware pottery that, because of the firing, varies from gray to jet black in color. And they're purchasing that pottery from Gaza, from Khan Yunis, from the area of... Um, Oh, Fallujah slash Kiryat Gat. There were a number of factories producing this pottery between at least 1700 uh, up until the 90s. Now, obviously, the nomads by the 90s, the nomads aren't buying the pottery. The pottery is for tourist trade or uh, whether it's external or internal or for, you know, using for planters. But they are acquiring this pottery by barter for uh, for using using. Um, cereals to pay the to pay for uh their goods they are even buying paraffin lamps uh to light up their tents at night um but you don't find a lot of uh, of coins of currency at their sites so the interpretation is there and you see this in the very few historical sources where they're basically bartering uh some of the crops that they grow for uh, various types of goods and obviously livestock they're selling. That's interesting that, you know, there are still pockets of people in the world who operate outside of a monetary system. Well, this would be up until the mid 20th century that they were operating outside the system. And uh, yeah, very much so. You don't find, the, you just... We even, when a colleague of mine and I excavated a Bedouin campsite on the border with Egypt, uh, we swept it with a metal detector and uh, we located uh, chains from necklaces, but no coinage. We found some cartridge shells from a later date, but no cash money at all. And the site was, we, the site was occupied over a 300 year period. We had almost 28 hearths. So it was repeatedly reused, but there was, we found, and maybe it's an accident of where we excavated, but absolutely no currency. And that, you know, brings up an interesting thing is that, you know, the concept of nomadic people and occupation, if you don't particularly like the occupation, I mean, who does, you can just pack up and leave. Exactly. And what we see um, you know, the, we know from historical sources that there is considerable movement and even, even, um, short-term movement for economic gain. So for example, when the tribes that I'm looking at in the Negev were engaged in agriculture in the forties, um, British, British documents are like, Hey, we have anywhere, if the harvest is good, or excellent, we've got anywhere from 3,000 to 12,000 tribesmen coming from the Sinai Peninsula to work in the harvest. 
Now they weren't they weren't interested so much in uh, like passport control. What they were interested in is that since they didn't since these tribesmen who were doing the agricultural harvest weren't paid with currency, they were paid with crops, and the British were annoyed because the crops, some of the the harvest was actually leaving the area and going into the peninsula as payment to these agricultural workers, which were actually tribesmen, but they picked up odd work. And that's something that a war-engaged British nation would enjoy having is more crops. Yeah, I mean, it's something that, uh, you know, would circulate. They wanted control, right? So, yeah. so I imagine that, you know, conflict in the area, as long as it's been going on, has been very um, disruptive to your research, or I at least assume it would be. Not, um, not particularly. I mean, there's uh, one year, uh, in general, I'm usually not there when conflict erupts. So for me, it's not a problem. The main, the main issue uh, on a certain level is getting access to certain areas. I, I prefer to uh, work close to the pardon me, close to the border with Egypt in that general area. And that at times can be problematic because uh, a large part of that area is used for military training. But sometimes um, a friend of mine in the uh, Antiquities Authority, which would be the, you know, the equivalent, let's say the Park Service had an archaeological branch. Um, she goes in and some of her colleagues to inspect an area before maneuvers to make sure they're not going to destroy anything. So in one case, she's like, hey, I got a present for you. I found three structures almost intact from the uh, beginning of the 20th century. And this area was all inhabited by tribes. So we're not talking villages or, or uh, farmsteads, but rather um, basically tribes people looting stone from archeological sites like Byzantine period and use that, using them to build structures. So what you're saying is they're recycling stones from older structures to maintain their lifestyle now. Um, yeah, in a sense that they're, you know, at the time they were they. I mean, when you say now, I'm thinking of 48 in the present. When you mentioned about security, one of the things that had happened for that, that that put an impact on an archaeological site, a colleague of mine and I were going to investigate. Uh, I don't know, five, six years ago, they really tightened the border with Egypt because of drug smuggling. Mm -hmm. So what had happened is my colleague said, listen, I found an interesting uh, abandoned structure from the first half of the 20th century built by one of these tribes. Let's check it out for possible value in excavation. So we drove to it. I got her knee was bothering her. I got out of the vehicle and I was greeted with this massive smell of pot. And as I got closer, what it is, it's a rectangular building split in two rooms, it was built sometime between the 20th century and occupied up to 1948. And they may end when I got closer to it, the left room was covered with plastic. And underneath the plastic were marijuana plants in individual planters. And they had also rigged up a camera with an internet connection so they could see you. So, I mean, that's the only thing. And we saw that and it's just like, okay, we're out of here. And she, you know, she did mention it to the police and the police were like, because they tightened the border, you know, everything is being used to grow pot in. So it's an archeological site, doesn't matter. If they can obscure it, they will. So that's the only, you know, the only real thing. It's it's actually pretty easy to work in Israel. Uh, for one site, I hired a, the one on the Egyptian border, I hired a uh, balloon. This was in 2007 to photograph the, uh, mint, the valley we were working in. And you know, I didn't need any permit. I didn't need any papers. We just called, said, okay, 
This is what it costs. They show up with a trailer, pull out their blimp, and they spent two hours taking photographs, low-level photographs. And this is obviously prior to drones. Otherwise, it'd be a lot cheaper to have a drone do it. But the photography, it was, you know, I didn't need any permits. Colleagues that I know work in other countries, drone photography or balloon photography can be difficult uh, to get permission to do. Yeah, but also keep in mind that riding in a balloon to take photographs is probably no. way more fun than using a drone. There's no, we weren't riding. It was all, they just had a uh, uh, automated camera slung under the balloon. If we could go in the balloon, that would have been fantastic. You'd have a great view in the sun. I mean, it would have been spectacular, but they just had attached a uh, camera to it and asked what angles you want and just put it on auto click. So do you, uh, I assume you get good quality images to work off of that way. It, it's the same thing as using a drone now. Yeah. Uh, I'd say the drone, obviously, um, you have probably more control because a colleague, as I had a friend help me with some drone photography uh, recently. Also, uh, Google uh, Google Earth is very good. Uh, you can get very good uh, resolution for some parts. And then there's a government, Israeli government equivalent to it where you get even higher resolution for some areas. So what I've done sometimes is actually, you can actually make plans off those images, go to the field, correct them, do a sur surface survey, um, and then um, you can kind of go from there. So when you do a surface survey, looking for nomadic people do you have to widen your search area just because you know they moved often um what we what we basically do for example uh it depends on the budget like everything else oh yeah so, obviously. <laughs> so the colleagues that i worked with uh from mississippi state i think we were walking in uh, about five five abreast with maybe 15 meters apart and just total pedestrian survey. Other colleagues uh, have done a higher, uh, more fine grain at 10, 10, 10 meters apart. But usually the way that we go for the sites is we're going to survey an area. The sites that we find in that area, we don't know the range of mobility that those tribes people had. We can just say that they're tribes people here, but we it's very difficult to say how far did they travel. We really can't do that. Uh, some people have looked at um, Neolithic herders and looked at their uh, corrals and looked at the dung layers from sheep and goat. And based on the dung and some other studies, they were able to say where the where the animals were grazed and then talk about distances from the site. But when we're when we don't have that particular evidence and we're just looking at the pottery and the and uh, the sites, we can say that they're in a location, but we can't say any more than than that. And I guess there's a lot of factors that come into account when you're tracking people who move on a regular basis you know how many steps the average person can take in a day i'm assuming adults could probably take more steps than kids could i mean they yeah um basically the the range of mobility that we see among these groups can vary considerably so for example you know, you may have uh, groups in Saudi, what's today Saudi Arabia, um, that do very long migrations. The groups that I look at, they may migrate um, seasonably, you know, 10 miles, maybe even less in some cases. It may be the opposite sides of an arroyo during different times of year because the wind changes. Um, so... Basically, these people are mobile, but looking at the sites themselves, it's hard to say how, you know, the distances that the inhabitants traveled, unless we have artifacts from distant locations, which would give us some insights.
So we're about out of time for the day. Uh, Benjamin, uh, for people who want to learn more about nomadic history or nomadic archaeology, what would you recommend to them? Um, this is self-serving. However, I just uh, published an article in uh, Historical Archaeology, and what it uh, what I did in that article was basically summarize all the archaeological evidence we know for Bedouin tribes people in the Negev, the types of sites, the historical sources. Another, if they're interested, they can take a look at that. Another source for students uh, would be to look at ethnoarchaeology that's been done. There was a lot of ethnoarchaeology in Jordan, in parts of the Middle East. Um, yeah, if you know, if students want, they can always send me an email. And uh, I'm happy to recommend uh, some uh, some uh, readings for them. Um, yeah, it's mostly scholar. I hate to say it. There's very little in the way of um, of uh, popular literature on archaeological research on nomads. There was there's basically I can't I can't think of anything offhand. But maybe I'm having a senior moment. So who knows? Well, I was going to say for students and those of you who are looking for, you know, future research interests and looking to get your name out there, you just got handed a really great opportunity. So find something you like, focus on it. Exactly. Well, yeah. Benjamin, it has been really great having you on the show. Um, any last minute things you want to toss out? Yeah. Um, Daniel, I, I thank you for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, if, uh, be in touch if you uh, want another verbal headlock about nomads. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a safe and happy holiday, everybody. Uh, from us here at Archaeology After Dark, we'll see you later. Happy holidays. <laughs>